I failed for seven years, okay? Enthusiastically, like I didn't side hustle these things. I was all in. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Founder Podcast. Today we're speaking with Dan Martell. He's the founder of SaaS Academy. He's founded multiple successful SaaS startups and he recently launched a book called Buy Back Your Time. So if you wanna understand how to get leverage, how to scale your business really fast and avoid burnout, then you have to listen to this interview. Dan's a super smart guy. He's very, very well respected in a lot of entrepreneurial circles and we have a lot of mutual friends. So Dan, I'm really excited to speak with you today. The first question that I ask everyone that comes on is, how did you get your job? AKA, how'd you find yourself doing the work you're doing today? So I got a crazy story. Um, I, I'll give you the short version because you know I want to get into the, the meat of our combo. But um, so what I do today is kind of software. So I, I run the largest coaching organization for software CEOs, but I've been coding since I was 17. But the way I got into software development is, I actually got in a lot of trouble as a kid, like like sons of anarchy type style, like like legit, you know, group home, foster home, crisis center, high speed chases, prison. And I ended up in rehab and it saved my life. At 16, 17, I, I went through a, a program for 11 months that literally um, allowed me to build my self-worth and rebuild the trust with my parents that I'd lost. And at the end of that program, I was helping Rick this maintenance guy clean out one of the cabins. It was built on an old church camp that they donated to this place. And in one of the rooms in this cabin was an old 486 computer and a yellow book on Java programming. And I opened the book and something spoke to me. I don't know why, but I just like followed chapter one, booted up the computer and within 20 minutes, I got the computer to say, hello world. And I thought, <laughs> so whatever reason, I thought I was like a computer genius, but, um, that's literally how I started, you know, growing up with uh, entrepreneurial air quote tendencies and then becoming obsessed and addicted, honestly, to writing code and software. And um, I haven't looked back. Yeah. Wow. So you're a dev first and foremost. Yeah. For a long time. Yeah. So uh, did you, you said what happened next? Like what was your first business? Well, this is always a fun question, right? It's uh, <laughs> I always ask people like, how many projects or domains did they buy versus their business? Cause like those are two different things. So the first thing I ever made money on was actually this app I built. This is 97. So I come, I come out and of rehab and I, I discover this little thing called the internet, which obviously turned out to be kind of a big thing, perfect timing. And I built a CD burning tool that my friends would pay me 20 bucks. Cause the problem with it, if you had a CD burner back in the day, some people are like, what's a CD burner? Um, is that they would sit on my computer to build their playlist. Cause you could put like 150, 200 songs on a CD. So I built this tool. They would download, it would synchronize with my file, um, drive on my computer from all my MP3s. I had downloaded off Napster and in LimeWire and Kazam and all these different tools. And then they could build their playlist and then they give me 20 bucks and then I would burn them a CD. And that was like the first, like, thing I built on my computer that I actually got paid to do. But my first company was probably at 18, 19, like not too long after I built a vacation rental uh, website for my dad initially. I, I kind of lied to my dad. My dad was like, hey, I need this web page for, cause he kept getting calls. He had a cottage he would rent out. And he asked me, he goes like, can you build me a web page? And then I went online and I wanted to learn this new programming language called Cold Fusion. So I told him that, to build a web page, it was going to cost 600 bucks. And he's like, why is it going to cost 600 bucks to host a web page of my cottage? And I was like, it's just what it costs. The truth was, is I wanted to rent a server on this site called one and one, one and one.com. And I needed that specific one that would run the cold fusion software. And so I took my dad's money and his project and built this vacation rental site, no different than VRBO, almost identical in concept, uh, in 1998, 99. And, um, and that was the first business that I actually launched. We called it uh, maritimevacation.ca. And the way I got customers was kind of nutty story is, and I didn't know anything about marketing or honestly making money on the internet at all. I was just a software guy. Um, 
and I told my buddy Dave about this idea I built, you know, the software that lets you create like a listings page for your, your cottage, your bed and breakfast in our area that we grew up in, in Canada. And he goes, Hey, there's this magazine that the government prints. It's like the tourism magazine. And on the back of the magazine is a listing of like, uh, all the bed and breakfasts and cottages for rent in the province. So I bet those people would want to pay you for one of your pages you could build with that thing you built. And I literally sat there in like awe, immediately ran to my computer, got this magazine, put, paid my little brother, he was like four years younger than me, to add all of the contact information, the addresses into a Microsoft Access database. And I paid him like three bucks an hour and then created a form letter in Microsoft Word and literally sent out to people a blanket like sales, you would probably call it direct mail, but it was just like this page that said like, we're maritime vacation. If you're looking to build a website for your bed and breakfast, fill out this application, which had all the details, send us $30 and three photos of your listing that we'll scan in and put on your, on your page. And if you want the photos back, add an extra $5 and we'll, we'll ship them back after. And uh, I sent out like hundreds of these. And I remember like maybe seven days after my dad came home and he like checked the mail and there was like a stack of envelopes and he just looks at me. Cause you know, obviously I grew up in a pretty, I was a little mischievous and he just, he just literally asked me like, what did you do? And I was like, holy moly. And we started opening up these letters. Cause you know, this is 99, 98 people, people had no problem sending 30 bucks in the mail in cash, but they were full of cash. And that was the first time I kind of made internet on the money from somebody that didn't know me. And I, I kind of joked that was the day that I went pro. Like, you know, there's like the day that you finally like quote unquote, make it for me. I, that was 18 with maritime vacation, even though it completely failed because a competitor called at the cottage.com kind of came in and absolutely crushed me. Um, it was an incredible experience. I learned a lot about entrepreneurship and just building a thing that was valuable to other people and marketing it. And that yeah, was a fun experience. Mm. So you've been in the game for a long time. 25 years. Yeah, wow. So, you know, uh, we were talking about this offline, you know, uh, we, I was trying to do an interview with you seven, eight years ago. We never got there. Uh, but you have been typically known as kind of like the SaaS guy. So I'd love to know, um, you know, you have a really large SaaS academy and, uh, you know, uh, some, some, some of my friends have joined it and like, you know, uh, spoke very, very highly of it. I'm curious, um, what was your first SaaS business and how did you fall into SaaS? Yeah, you know, SaaS was one of those things I think growing up in a, a world with a lot of chaos that the predictability of it just spoke to me. So back when I started, we just called it like ASP, um, like application service provider. Like we would host the application. There were hosted services. We didn't even call it that. I mean, it's gone through this evolution of like, I would say hosted solutions to web-based products, to subscription, to cloud, to now SaaS is kind of the thing we call the category. Um, the, the first, I mean, I built a bunch of SaaS tools with my company Spheric, which was like the next company that, um, well, actually, no, I did a hosting company that failed. I, I failed for seven years. Okay. Enthusiastically. This is what's what people I think don't know is like, I didn't side hustle these things. I was all in, like, I would sit there and code 12, 14 hours a day. I would, you know, whatever I had to do. And so like I did the hosting company and that, and that failed because we had a bank as a customer. I almost got sued. So did I, went, I got way over my skis on that one. And then my third company was a company called Spheric Technologies and we built enterprise portal, uh, portlets they were called. So this is back when intranets I, I'm dating myself. Some people were like, what is that? Well, it was, big companies started customizing the homepage experience for their employees, right? You open up the browser and the default page would be their intranet, but then intranets got smart and those were called portals. I built SaaS products for fortune 500 companies to integrate with their ERP systems. We're talking Siebel, Oracle, SAP, you know, BEA weblot, like all these different enterprise solutions. We built these subscription software tools 
that people would install inside their companies, but pay us for them in 2004. So that company, I mean, when I started it, I hired a business coach. He was an E-Myth certified coach named Ooh, Bob. Michael and Goodman. um yeah, he was the reason why I finally had success in business. And that company Spheric, uh, we almost did a million in our first year, just shy. And then we literally grew about 150% every year for four years. Um, and I just, I went with it and eventually we got acquired in early 2008. And that was, that was my first kind of, uh, successful entrepreneurship experience. And it laid the foundation for a lot of things afterwards. Mm. So I have to ask the question, um, you started many other companies since clarity.fm flow town, and then, yeah, you started your SAS Academy and uh, you kind of gone full circle now and you really give back. How come you haven't started another SaaS business? Like, because, you know, uh, some say, and I, I'd like to hear your take, that like in terms of wealth creation, building a SaaS company is, is one of the, the best tools out there. But it's yeah, hard, so, I it's mean, super hard, in, like it's super hard. Well, yeah, so, so what's interesting is, is in the book, I actually talk about what I call the three levels of trades. Um, level one is employee, right? Where you trade your, uh, time for money, um, which, you know, you can make a lot of money. The highest paid employee in the world makes over hundred million a year. And that's Tim Cook of Apple. So it's not even like, there's no good or bad. It just is, you know, people trade their time essentially for money. And then when you go to level two, which is entrepreneurship, that's when you start to learn how to trade money for time, right? You hire an employee to buy back your time to then reinvest it in you know, things that make you more money. And then level three is money for money. And that's where you learn the skill to invest in opportunities that have your money working for you. And I just got lucky that when I was 27, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And, you know, I kind of started to understand the, the quadrant he talks about and kind of the investor element. And I just started investing my money. So what people don't realize is I have a portfolio, a pretty substantial portfolio of SaaS companies I've invested in. And that's kind of what I do day to day. So I have SaaS Academy, which is the largest coaching organization for SaaS CEOs in the world. We have, I mean, over a thousand active clients. We've coached, I think 4,000 people at this point. And then I have High Speed Ventures and High Speed Ventures is my kind of personal family office where, you know, we'll evaluate buying companies. We'll, uh, we've invest, we invest in companies. Now we're considering putting together a fund to actually invest in some of our earlier stage companies that we coach. Um, so yeah, I kind of a while ago decided to ask myself, and it's why I wrote this book is, you know, what would my perfect week look like? What kind of work would I be doing? What's important to me at this stage of my career, you know, what do I, what do I want my life to stand for? And I just like, to me, I'd rather support CEOs of SaaS companies and either through coaching or investing. And then, um, you know, just work, you know, cause I have two young kids, like have a little bit more, I wouldn't say worth like, like, like work-life integration. That's kind of what I'm optimizing for. So I, I think that, especially doing a venture back company is completely different. A lot of my clients I coach are bootstrapped. So I think that, but again, I, I now hire CEOs to run companies. So I'm not, I don't need, again, it's the whole buying back your time. At some point you go, look, I love being a CEO, but I don't want to be the CEO of this company. I can just hire somebody to run it. Mm. Yeah, no, you, you mentioned work-life integration. I like that term a lot because yeah, I think I think that's what life is all about. You know, I read this um, tweet storm by Sir Hill Bloom, and uh, he does some great stuff. And uh, you know, one of the things he said was like, you know, the the most important uh, decisions you have to make, and one of the most important decisions you have to make in like, there's a f few of them, like who who's your life partner, and one of them is who you work with, and then the other one is what you decide to do with your time in terms of work, and like. Yeah, like work doesn't have to be something that you have to, you know, balance that you do too much of. Like, how do you integrate it into your life that you have like an in incredible life? Yeah, I mean, so it's funny because Sahil and I were actually chatting yesterday. Nathan Barry introduced us uh, for, I think, his new book he's working on. And we absolutely share the same philosophy. 
um, you know, the way I do it is I think there's three things you need to kind of like integrate work and your life into like a rhythm. First thing you need is a vision. And, you know, and this, I actually cover this in the book because I realize when people are trying to understand the value of their time and buying it back and then what do I do with the newfound time without a clear vision, it makes it really hard to make decisions today. So I always, you know, coach my clients to like look out at least 25 years. And in the book, I call it the 10X vision map. So once you understand on like these four dimensions, I share what our life looks like, then you work backwards to, you know, what would be the next 12 months directionally accurate decisions, both the quality of life, how you want to show up as a parent, how you want to show up as a leader, how you, the empire you want to build um, over the next 12 months. And then you then come to the, the weak cadence. Cause I think that's like, if somebody says something's important to me, I just ask them to see their calendar because usually they will, whether they like it or not, where they allocate their time is a clear indication to what's important to somebody. So to me, I always start with the rhythm in my calendar that's aligned with the 12 month goals, personal, professional, that's aligned with the, the 10X vision map so that I can be super intentional about today. So when it comes to work-life integration, because I have that long-term view and short-term view, I can, I make decisions on a weekly, monthly basis, such as, you know, every week I have date night with my wife. Every week I have a night off to go spend it with friends. Every week I, you know, we have, uh, the full day is dedicated to the family. We usually go skiing right now because it's winter or wake surfing in the summer. We, you know, I work out every day. Like there's, when you know what's important to you and you actually add to your calendar, you like insert it as block time. You know, again, I teach this in, in the perfect week framework you realize there's a whole lot of extra time to do other stuff. And then you don't get to a place where you're having to fix things. See, the reason why I got so intentional is because there was a point in my career where I was, I was moving forward really fast, but then I'd have to slow down to fix what I call emotional shrapnel, right? You have to apologize to somebody for missing something, or you gotta, you know, you gotta go to the gym because you put on 15 pounds because you were traveling too much or whatever it is. So like, what I've decided is if I can be more intentional today, aligned with my goals, I can actually get more time long-term back because I'm not spending time fixing those things that I'm creating emotional shrapnel around because I'm kind of measuring twice and cutting once, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. So um, in the book, uh, you talk about how to scale your business fast. Uh, you, you help entrepreneurs build, like scale their business fast without avoiding burnout. So I wanna talk about that one because I experienced burnout uh, post COVID. Um, the online education industry, for, you know, sort of founder like we, 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 you know, had a big, big wave through COVID, and I didn't stop. And you just work, right? Like in Melbourne, we were like the longest city to be locked down. It's like Canada and Australia were not not doing well during COVID. Yeah, so I, I don't know why I didn't escape. I, I don't know, but anyway, so come out of lockdown and just experience this deep burnout. I never experienced burnout in my life. It was just such a crippling feeling. I used to wake up in the middle of the night, my heart beating really fast, this like crazy anxiety. And I didn't even want to go to work at times. Um, and I worked through it, but I'm curious, have, have you experienced burnout? Is that, you know, and, and I'd love to hear how you've worked through it and, and some of the things that perhaps you help, like, you know, guide your founders to experience like not experience burnout because i think it's a, it's yeah. it's easy to to get it fall into that i really appreciate the question question nathan because that was my reality 24 to 28 when i was building my company spheric technologies i only had one gear and it was all in i didn't know any different and because i'd failed prior i was so scared to do it again that once i started to get a taste of success or momentum i was so scared of losing it that I just allowed my work to absorb me, to, to become me, my identity, everything, my relationships, uh, what I valued. And, you know, I was engaged to a woman that um, for the most part put up with it. I mean, it was kind of, when I look at how I showed up in that relationship, it's absolutely embarrassing. And what happened was is, you know, towards the, you know, two and a half years I was into this relationship, 
with uh, this woman, we got engaged. I was, you know, we ended up buying a house together and, um, you know, one Sunday, cause I worked every day, Saturday, Sundays, but Sundays I was usually home by noon. And she told me you got to be home by 1130. We've got to go. My friend's having a birthday party. And I went to the office and, you know, I look up and I was in the zone. I was getting stuff done and it's one 30 and I free, I'm like, Oh no. So I like jump in my car, this old Volkswagen Jetta and rush home, pull into her driveway and I run in the house and I found her in tears in the kitchen and she's just beside herself and can't even breathe. She's just, you know, and she just looks at me and she goes, I can't do this anymore. And she takes her ring off and she drops it on the counter and walks past me and goes and lives with her parents. And that was, that was the last day, seven weeks before our wedding. And it was so, such a shot to my self-worth and my identity. Cause like, you know, as entrepreneurs, we say we're doing it for our, our families, right? We're doing it for our future. And you know, it's a sacrifice today for that future. And I just totally had it backwards. So when you talk about like anxiety, I mean, I, I got to a place where I, I felt like there was a elephant on my chest. I had to go see a therapist because I was having anxiety attacks and he made me walk around with a rock in my pocket and would squeeze it. I mean, it's just, you know, and, and what, what I love about the work I get to do today, that was the moment that I realized I had to find a different way to build comp I think like if I didn't go through that, I would never have written the book. I would have never, um, uh, found the tools to build the kind of companies I have in the way I have. And today, like, you know, I, in, in chapter two, I open it with a story of one of my clients, Stuart, same scenario. Like he just, because he could do everything, he did everything. He had a background in finance. So he did all the bookkeeping. He taught himself how to code. So he would write code, even though he was like, you know, a team of like 20 people, he would still be in the customer support tickets and doing all this stuff. And, you know, 60, 70 hours a week wasn't an issue, but when you'd have to like do a big product release and sprint, like he went through and it required those 90 hour weeks. Like it takes a toll on your body and you don't even know it at the time. And he found himself in Disneyland. So they shipped the software at Christmas, this big release. They shipped the software. They, he decides I'm going to take my kids and my wife to, and her sister to Disneyland as a sorry, I've been busy, but I want to like, you know, give you something kind of gift. And as he's walking in towards the magical kingdom, he has a full on what he thought at the time was a heart attack um, and didn't want his his wife to freak out. So tells her, I got to use the bathroom. You go ahead, he sits on a bench and summons help and goes straight to the hospital or to the emergency on site. And they, they realize it's not a heart attack. It's a panic attack. And he's telling me the story because I only started working with him probably seven months after that moment because he just kept every two weeks, like it, he just lost his ability to work. It was almost, he, he explains it like he was like hung over, right? Like where he's tired and fatigued. And this is where I find a lot of entrepreneurs, right? When they eventually come into my world, you know, people that have adrenal fatigue, they have their body literally says, I don't want to do this anymore. And you don't seem like you're going to slow down. So boom, and they just drop it. So the, the short answer of how I help them is, is this framework called the buyback loop. And the buyback loops based on a principle called the buyback principle, which states you don't hire people to grow your business. You hire people to buy back your time. So it's a calendar over capacity problem. And to do that, you need to figure out what your buyback rate is. How much can I afford to pay other people to do things so that I could, and this is where the loop comes in. The buyback loop is audit transfer fill. When I hit the pain line, I need to immediately go to an audit, what I call a time and energy audit. And we walk through their calendar and we figure out all the things that take energy from them, all the things that give them energy, all the things that are low cost to pay somebody else to do, and then all the things that would cost a lot. So I, I use a $4 sign symbols. $1 sign is low cost, $4 is high. Then we take all the stuff that's red and $1 sign task and we put it into a bucket and that is the person we're gonna hire next. Okay, we're not going to go hire somebody to write more code. We're not going to hire somebody to run a support department. We're not going to hire somebody to publish your social media photos. We're literally going to start with all the things in that bucket. And that's the transfer step. So first is audit, then transfer. And we, and I have a system that I teach people on how to get things off your plate in a way that you still feel in control, but that you no longer own those outcomes. And then the third step is to fill. 
And if you don't fill properly, then you actually don't create the, the, the momentum in the loop to go to the next stage, right? Most people don't get this right. Filling is one of three things. Filling is a decision to invest in either doing the thing that you do best that makes you money. So if you have, if you buy back 10 hours a week and you're a designer and you're getting paid hundred dollars an hour and your buyback rates only like $12, yeah, go do more design work, right? But if that's maximized, then you got to go look at, you know, where's the biggest leveraged opportunity. And I usually look at it through skills. You know, these are things like strategy or know-how or acquiring knowledge, right? The other one is beliefs. A lot of entrepreneurs are stuck where they're at because they have a, a belief about the world that just simply isn't true. So they need to do some mindset work. And that's my favorite part that I help founders with. And then the other one is character traits, right? You could be incredibly skilled, have a great you know, view on the world, but are not consistent character trait and you'll never create momentum, right? So that's the fill part. If you do that, then you get to go up the buyback loop to the next you know, opportunity or pain line because the whole point is I want to teach people how to build a company they don't grow to hate. And, and I actually have proven through my own personal experience in my life and many of my clients like Omar, who I know you know at Webinar Ninja, where the more you grow, the more freedom you have in your life, which sounds impossible to many entrepreneurs. And it's actually mathematically impossible not to have that if you follow these simple principles. Mm, yeah, I love it. Um, the question that's just shouting at me is, um, so you said that a lot of the SaaS founders you coach often bootstrapped. Uh, what about the ones that raised have raised money or significant money? Is it possible to operate with the kind of frequency that you speak of if you've got pressures from VCs and you've raised a truck ton of money and there's a lot of lot hanging on your shoulder. Yeah. So here's the only thing that changes. So, so 70% of my clients are bootstrapped. 30% are venture backed. When you figure out what your buyback rate is, let's say it's $12 and 50 cents. The only thing that changes for a venture back company is I, I tell them to add a zero to it. And the reason why you add a zero is because what an investor is giving you capital to do today is they're buying a future outcome. So, so there's this bet they're making and it's high risk. So you, that's why you add a zero and it sounds crazy. So you're saying like my buyback rate is now $125. Yep. But the reason why is because you're able to be um, a little bit wasteful today with the anticipation that those decisions are the right decisions for the future. But nothing changes in regards to and this is actually where I learned this strategy was moving to Silicon Valley after I sold my first company that was successful and meeting these early 20 year old entrepreneurs that were building, you know, 50, hundred million dollar companies, people like Naval Ravikant, right? So Naval taught me the idea of leverage. Everybody has the same amount of time. It's a constant and certain people have a higher ability to create an output. Okay. Elon Musk's output is on another level but his time is the same. So what's the difference? Well, the difference is the multiplier of leverage. And there's only four ways to create leverage. They're called the four C's. The first one is content. What we're doing now, a hundred million people could watch this and it wouldn't take any extra time for them to do that from us. So huge leveraging content. Playbooks is another example, creating a repeatable documented system. The second C is code, software, automation, AI, right? Huge leverage. It's why SaaS businesses in general have such high multiples is because they help companies get more productivity out of their teams, um, do more with less people, et cetera. Like there's a reason why they're, they're valuable assets to build. So that's, that's code. Third is capital, which we all know right? Like we raise capital and this is why the buyback rate goes up. If you have capital, it's because I'm looking for leverage, right? But in regards to the decision structure and the sequencing and the filtering and what you should do with the free time, everything stays the same. You just get to move faster because you have that capital. The four C is collaboration. And it's the, it's literally the premise of my book. It's regardless of what business you're in, when you start to grow, you're deploying dollars to acquire like employees time or contractors. And that's the collaboration C. And 
most people just do it in the wrong order. So, it, so instead of like buying back time out of their calendar by hiring people to grab those buckets of thing that drain their energy, that's very little cost to get off their plate. They sometimes make the mistake of hiring like COOs and chief product officers and VPs of sales when they're a small team of seven. And it's like, as a CEO, how about you start with not doing your laundry and not cleaning your apartment and not managing your inbox and, you know, not spending all day long, you know, doing customer support. Now, I don't disagree that there's value in some of these things like customer support has a ton of product innovation. But what I coach my clients on is pay somebody to process the emails to find the customer innovation and you can collaborate with them. And that's way more leverage than you literally spending four hours a day doing customer support emails. Mm. Yeah, man, this is gold. Like, uh, so really the, the main premise of your book is kind of like how to, how to find leverage and optimize your time. The whole, it's funny cause people, you know, people go, oh, buy back your time. It's about productivity. Well, it is, but it's more than that. People go, oh, it's about scaling a business. Yep, 100%. But it'll also help you be a better creator. It'll help you be a better artist. It'll help you be a better team member. It'll help you live a more expressed life. It'll actually give you a path to building the thing that you want to build that you had a belief about that it would require sacrifice. And it's just not true. I mean, one of my favorite stories from yesterday, actually a guy that follows me, Mike, he's known me for like 12 years. And he's like, I got, I literally have the audio. I'm going to, I'm going to post. I'll even give it to you. If you guys want to add it to this, this article. Um, but he sent me a message. Cause he's like, dude, I've been, I've been friends with you for a while. I've been watching you from afar. I know we don't know each other well, but I just, I always put you in this category of like this hustle culture, like Gary V, like go, 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 go. And man, I just finished listening to your book. He listened to it in a day, the audio version. And he's like, I totally misunderstood you. And, and I understand that you actually value the same things I value and I'm sorry. And, and he sent me this message. And then what I love the best though, is the second message he sent right after was, you made me realize that I had a belief because he had a company that like literally blew up his life. No, you know, what we were talking about earlier, just like overwhelmed him. And then he just burnt out and then he ended up selling it for less than it was worth. And he just like had essentially trauma from that experience and he promised he would never do it again. So he's built this like different business today. That's very much a lifestyle business that provides and gives him a lot of freedom. And, you know, he's very happy with it, but he, and he says in this message, I now realize that I had a belief about what impact I could have and the level I could have and the limiting of that level because I thought I was scared to go back to that place. But you now have given me the roadmap on having a bigger impact and still honoring the commitments I've made to my family, et cetera. And he goes, that's exciting. That for Mike is what I want for every person. I want entrepreneurs to create more. I want artists to create more art. I want content creators to create more content. I just don't want them doing stuff that somebody else should be doing because their time and their creativity at the scale of their business, if you understand your buyback rate, shouldn't be spent on editing videos or publishing on social media at scale. Like you can definitely find people that are as capable and honestly better at those things so that you can go focus on creating opportunities that are better and or taking the time to recharge and go spend it with people so you can do it for a decade and not burn out after three. Yeah, that's cool. I respect that a lot, man. So love to switch gears uh, a little bit and talk about building a SaaS business. Um, do you think out of all online businesses, e-com, you know, services, agency, lead gen, online education, like, SaaS is, is the hardest? Um, no. Here's what I've learned. All businesses are hard. You know, you think about the internet, right? Well, the internet made things a hundred times easier for people to like source information and communicate, et cetera. And I think a lot of people thought like, oh, we're gonna have a resurgence of like a hundred times more entrepreneurs. And the data actually doesn't show that. The data shows that there's still the same amount of entrepreneurs per capita. What's changed with technology and innovation is that there, the, the wealth creation is just more distributed towards the top. 
because the tooling and capabilities of certain entrepreneurs, they have more leverage, kind of what we're talking about the four C's. So the reason why I don't think SaaS is harder is because I think the hardest part in any business is the conversation the CEO has with themselves. It's the real estate between their ears. And it doesn't matter if it's SaaS, e-commerce, drop shipping, lawn care, babysitting, closet organizing, sign company. You can make money in any business, right? You name me a business and I can point to a billion dollar company. You know, you can you can have a, a food truck or you can have a McDonald's empire, right? So it's not it's not the business model that's hard. It's the capability of a of a an individual to grow through the challenges, to become a person who can deal with higher level problems. You know, one of my mentors, this guy Roger, he says to me, he goes, and a long time ago he taught me this. He goes, you want to increase the level of problems that he calls them factors of 10, you know, like when you start off a $10 problem is kind of a thing, right? And maybe for some people are like, oh, I never found that was a $10, but maybe it's a hundred dollar problem, right? Your cell phone bills like overage is a hundred dollars and you're like, oh no. And you like reach out to the company and you freak out and you tell them they got to give you a refund or whatever. You're going to cancel and you threaten them. I mean, eventually, hopefully you get to where thousand dollar problems start showing up like $10 problems, right? And if you're Richard Branson, who had the privilege of spending time with, and I write about in the book, the the time I was hanging out with him at his house in Switzerland, he had just had a rocket ship blow up. So he's having like a $100 million problem day. His $50,000, $100,000 problems don't even register on his radar because he's become the person who can deal with a higher quality problem. And I think that's, if you said like, is it a business model is hard? No. What's hard is that people don't understand that the game they're playing is not the business model. It's themselves, right? Are there certain industries that have higher gross margins? Are there certain industries that have easier ways to get distribution? Are there certain businesses that have uh, more elegant uh, reoccurring models like SaaS where you know the, the, the reoccurring nature of it makes it easier to operate because there's predictability? For sure but that doesn't change the complexity of any business, which is people. It doesn't change the complexity of like software requires you to manage and understand a technical component, right? Like I can manage a restaurant pretty much without knowing anything about restaurants. Cause I, I know how to cook a little bit and I, I do, but to scale a restaurant, to build a profitable restaurant, those are completely different sets of problems that I would say are on the same scale as like understanding how to manage product and engineering in a software company. Now, valuations are completely different because if you can get them to a certain level, the annuity component of a subscription business with a, you know, what's called net negative churn or, or positive uh, net revenue retention is valuable to people on a factor that's a lot higher than a restaurant. But the truth is, is like at scale, all companies are valued similarly. Like multiples will be like, okay, well, this one's a six X on EBITDA. This one's a 10 X on EBITDA. Like, but I mean, at that level, like they're relatively the same. So I, yeah, I just, I don't know if they're harder because I've seen friends struggle just as much starting a lawn care company as they, they have building a software product. That's an interesting take. Um, you talk about problems. Can you talk us through the one, three, one method? This is easily one of my favorite um, things to teach people because I think it has the highest impact for least amount of effort. Like we think about minimum effective dose as a leader, this tool can transform somebody if they truly apply it. The way it works is most uh, business owners and entrepreneurs, and usually it's around 12 employees where they start to feel the pain, right? Where they wake up and you know, they, they, you know, they have like a list of projects they want to work on and their inbox has a couple hundred emails they have to get back to and, and they start their day. And next thing you know, they're on a meeting after meeting after meeting, trying to tell people what to do, check that they got it done and tell them what to do next, right? And the problem with that is that at about 12 employees, your day starts to look like Groundhog Day where you spend the whole day for the most part trying to get people doing the right thing in their work and then put, and putting out fires. And then pretty much like once, if you have kids, you put, you know, you feed the kids, you put them to bed. Or once you get, you know, finished dinner, you then go back to work, just to actually start on the projects you said you would do in the morning that you didn't get to and reply to all the emails that are urgent that you know if you don't get back to, they're gonna be upset. The one, three, one rule, gives a tool where any problem that a direct report brings into your world, 
you ask them to come with one clear problem. Okay. That's the one, one clear problem. Cause people will come to you with multiple, you know, they're like, what I, I literally, I'm even when I'm coaching clients and they're explaining to me their scenario, I go, so define the challenge. Give me the specific problem. Cause right now you talked about, I'm counting three, maybe four in what you just said. And they're like, well, here's the problem we need to solve. Okay. Let's, let's get that clear. Okay. Perfect. Then what you ask somebody to then do is say, what are your three viable options? So the three viable options are, you know, uh, well, we could invest in this software and do this. We could, um, hire this consultant that can do this, or we can decide to, um, you know, shut this down and do this instead. Right. So three viable options. And then the other one, so it's one, three, one is what's the one recommendation they have, you know, out of those three, I'm, I'm recommending two. I probably use this like just today, probably eight, nine times on calls, eight, nine times on Slack. Like I, I continuously remind people like, you know, once time I had a HR director come to me and he's like, you know, I got a problem. I was like, what's the issue? He's like, I got to hire 12 people in the next quarter. And I go, cool. He goes, well, I don't know how to do that. I go, well, that sounds like a fun challenge. He's like, yeah, but I don't know how to do it. And I go, okay. And he's like looking at me to give him the answer. And I go, Here, here's the challenge. I, I know why you came to me and I appreciate and understand the frustration, but like, if I give you the answer, I'm technically doing your job. And Steve Jobs said it best. He said, the easy thing is to hire somebody and tell them what to do. The hard thing is to hire somebody and have them tell you what to do. So what I said to him is like, go do the one, three, one. Do you have it? And he's like, no. And I'm like, cool. How much time do you need? He's like, give me a couple days. I said, perfect. When you're ready, call me. I'll be available. The next day he texts me. I'm good. He didn't need me. He, he knew exactly once he did the research, the obvious solution was the one he picked. So he didn't even have to do one, three, one with me. And that's the beauty of the one, three, one is that over time, when you build this into your culture and you teach it to people, you'll get so much more leverage because you're pushing decision-making down to the front line, right? Whereas as you grow, if you don't do this, everything keeps bubbling up to the top. And that's why they call it a bottleneck because it's at the top and it's the founder, it's the entrepreneur, it's the CEO. And you want to push things down and be owned by people. I mean, 90% of the time somebody presents me their one, three, one in the recommendation. It's of course, that is the obvious solution. Do that. Right. So then, then I only get presented the really fun stuff. Yeah. Wow. That's gold. That, that is gold. Thank you for sharing, man. I have to ask though, then, uh, your one-on-ones must be pretty short with your direct reports or you had like, you used to have, what are you doing when you're coaching if they're not bringing problems, right? Like more feedback. Yeah. So I have a very structured, uh, approach for me. What I've learned a long time ago is, so there's like the business sequencing problems and, sh- and like those kind of things. What I like to do in my one-on-ones is two things. One, I want to get, well, probably three. I want to get clear that they understand the vision, right? Because I think as a CEO, there's three things we do. Vision, people, and money. So in my one-on-ones, I, I make sure I'm always communicating 16 months, 18 months into the future. So I'll just take some time to share that. I'll ask them for their perspective. Where are we going? If we can get alignment, you know, begin with the end in mind on where we're going, then I want to talk about their specific areas of opportunity. And these are, again, these are not strategic. These are, you know, what characters, uh, uh, traits are you working on? What skills are you working on? You know, based on where we're going, where, who do you need to become to get us there? And then I always talk about their personal and professional goals because I learned a long time ago, you know, especially as I coach, it's fun for me to, to, to work with like incredibly talented CEOs, but see these patterns emerge. And that's why I wanted to write a book about this and things like they're frustrated with their team because their team doesn't show up the way they do to solve the problem. Right. They always feel like they're always pulling everybody up the mountain and like trying to get them to follow their vision. And it just feels like they're, there's just a lot of weight on their shoulders to carry. And what I usually tell them is, do you have clarity on your direct reports, personal goals in their life. Right. And they're like, yeah, I know what they want. I'm like, okay, let me be clear. Do you, do you know exactly where they want to be in five years? Like, can you describe to me where your direct report in five years, what their life looks like to the same degree that you could explain to me what their life looks like today? Cause today you could tell me what their title is, how much they make made, what are their responsibilities, 
and other things. Can you tell me the same thing in five years? And they're like, no. Okay, perfect. Can you tell me in 12 months what that looks like? And they're like, well, I kind of know some things. It's like, okay. If the direct report doesn't, if you don't know what their goals are personally and professionally, and you haven't explained to them how your business is gonna support them in doing that, then you will always feel like you're trying to pull people up a mountain. The moment you get their almost selfish desires aligned with the company's goals, it will change the game on the energy and the culture you have in your company. So that's what I spend most of my time on my one-on-ones is vision, kind of like coaching areas of the leaders and kind of the opportunities for them. I actually have a teach a coaching framework in my book because I think a lot of people don't even know how to do that. And then the third is alignment of personal goals with the company goals in kind of long term. Yeah. Wow. Thank you, man. Um, that was that was incredible. Uh, so this has been like a bit of a leadership masterclass as well. <laughs> you ask the questions. <laughs> I, I love this stuff. Uh, man, I could talk to you all day. I'm conscious of time. We have to work towards wrapping up. So these are, yeah, we're going to move the hot seat round. These are short, rapid fire question answers. The first one I have is what's the best hire you've ever made in your career? It's always my co-founders or my business partners. Everyone, I think, and that's the thing that's unique about me. I have a lot of business partners. I give them equity. I collaborate with them. And every time I've been able to give away long-term upside, it's always worked out. So I, I just call, I'm very generous in the term business partner and equity. What's your favorite time of the work day? I love creating with smart people. So typically that happens in the afternoons for me because I don't do meetings in the morning. So that's like my personal creative space. So yeah, anytime I get to co-create with other people that I admire their brains. What's the last problem you solved? That would have been, um, oh, a product. So this morning I was working with my head coach on a new diagnostic tool that we're creating for our clients that will literally ask them four or five questions and give them the specific, powerful growth playbook that we've designed to, to mathematically prove and grow their business in the biggest way possible. That was this morning. That's crazy, okay. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about this. What's something you've learned today? The power of story. I did an interview earlier and I was just answering questions the way I do because I'm a little left brain. And I realized without the stories, you don't have the glue for the information to stick. Mm. Last one. If you could have dinner with any entrepreneur, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Elon Musk. He has a way of solving problems using a first principle approach that I've yet to understand or try to, I, I'm trying to master. And I know one day I'll have the opportunity to talk with him and it will be one of the most fascinating conversation I think he's ever had with another person, ever. Love it. Awesome. Well, we'll wrap there, Dan. Actually, last question. Where's the best place people can find out more about yourself, your academy, your latest book? Yeah, I would say buybackyourtime.com for the book, uh, sasacademy.com if you're looking for coaching, and then danmartel.com to follow along on the interwebs for me personally. Instagram is one of my favorites, but I'm also on Twitter, LinkedIn, TikTok, um, and just send me a message. Uh, I'm very responsive and I would love to uh, connect with people listening. And especially if you read the book and it serves you in any way, I'd love to hear specifically what behavior it caused you to change. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Dan. Really appreciate your time. It's an honor. Thanks, Nathan. Hey, Founder Fam, did you love this interview? Well, if you did, then make sure to subscribe. We're dropping new interviews every single week and we can't wait for you to join the journey. All right, we'll see you soon.